Good evening, everybody. We're just getting organized here. So give us a few seconds. It's going to be a very dry meeting tonight. I don't have my iced tea. I have water only. I have to nudge him to wake him up. I can do that. David, extra agendas for the audience? Yes, bring it's on her way. She'll be bringing extra agendas. Excellent. Thank she, you. She's tied up a little bit in traffic, but she'll be right here. Okay. So, um, we have, we're going to try our consent calendar tonight for the first time. So we have two items on the consent calendar. Does anybody want to add anything to it or take anything off of it? Hearing nothing, is, is there a motion on the consent calendar? Make, make a motion to accept the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Do we need to say there were warrants in minutes? Okay, we can. The agenda was, um, we had warrant number 101 and minutes from June 10th. And for those of you who watched last night on the planning board <coughs> meeting and saw the select board shuffle off into another room to conduct some items of business, we conducted two items of business. We issued a permit to use the common for tonight, which is uh, going on, Habitat for Humanity is having a picnic on the common. And we also authorized a permit for filming next door in the Emily Dickinson movie. It's called Yes, it's called A Quiet Passion starring Cynthia Nixon. So they actually were filming yesterday and we approved their permit yesterday. So, so that's what we did during that time period. So get started. Um, we have our public comment period at seven o'clock every night now. So is there anyone here who just has a issue they wish to talk to us about? No, you have to know what the agenda is and make all your comments during those 15 minutes. <laughs> well, some? No, 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 no. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> no, this is just for things that are on. Have you ever been to Amherst? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is for things that you want to come up that isn't on the agenda or something to come up that you want to talk about. Um, Rather people coming in last minute, like right now, and having something that needed to be on the agenda that would have to wait till next week. Yeah, right. You know, we could pre-plan it a week ahead of time and, and no, I think get the facts way. together, you know. Mm -hmm. We just don't do any discussion on it at this time. We just take your information and, and try to get back to you or have yeah. you come back again. <coughs> Okay, so we have a 715 appointment. Uh, I've got something. Oh, go ahead. Real quick. Um, have you given any thought to the email I sent you suggesting that the, uh, what, the July 15th meeting be held in the music room? Uh, we thought about it. We haven't gone anywhere with it yet. Yeah. We'll know by July 1st. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to, I think, well, I'm leaning towards just doing it in the senior center. But we'll talk yeah, to a few. The yes. Senior center this evening, there wasn't a parking space that available there for the people from the AA meeting there. Okay. All right. So we're still looking at that. Yeah, we haven't decided. Right. We haven't decided yet. Um, so we can't really start our 715 discussion yet. So we'll, uh, we'll start with Holly Road and Laurel Drive. Follow up from last night's meeting with the planning board. So, um, I prepared for you two actions for Holly Road and for Loran, uh, Laurel Drive. Um, we did have the meeting with the planning board last night to talk about uh, the roads, private roads in the town of Hadley. We went through the list of roads and did, uh, talked about the status uh, and future disposition of these uh, roads. Uh, Holly Road and Laurel Drive were chief among them, but also were Bayberry, Gooseberry. Uh, let's see if I can find my list here. Um, Birch Meadow Drive. Uh, there were, we talked about issues of ownership. We talked about issues of condition of the, of the road. Talked about issue of, of um, procedure uh, according to the planning board subdivision rules and regulations that uh, have been in effect and are in effect now. We also talked about uh, roads that do not require town action. Uh, portion of Honeypot Road, Red Smith's Road, 
Burke's Way, Golden Court, Greenleaves Drive, Hockenham Woods, and Westgate Center Drive. And those do not require um, action because either there's some permanent uh, stipulation on the, those roads that they are going to remain private forever or that they were not uh, presented to the planning board under subdivision regulations and so have the uh, status of driveways. Uh, so uh, we identified Holly Road as a priority uh, and we talked about uh, costs of upgrading that road. We talked about the need for a title search in order to establish definitively uh, uh, who actually owns the road and what kind of action this uh, town meeting ultimately would have to take in order to convert the road from a private drive to a public way. Okay. So we still need to get the information on what it's going to take to weigh it out. And so probably our next course of action for the select board would be to get together to see the schedule from the fall town meeting going back to see everything we need to do and then what we're going to have to do to actually get it laid out, surveyed, and the title okay. search done. All right, well, we have, we have a survey. We have a legal description of Holly Road. Um, I, I'm working with uh, town council in order to determine what would be the costs for a title search and uh, how long would that take. Uh, I don't think the cost would be high and I don't think it's going to take very long. The big time issue here would be the uh, de uh, de declaration of the select board's intention to lay out uh, Holly Road as a public way and then to send a letter to the planning board. The planning board has 45 days to uh, make a decision or, or provide some sort of action with respect to the select board's intention to lay out Holly Road as a public way. If we were to take that vote tonight and if I were to, to deliver the planning board the letter tomorrow, then we're talking about uh, August 3rd is the 46th day uh, and your warrant closes on August 29th, 26th rather. Uh, so this, these two things can happen simultaneously, the title search and the notice to planning board. If the planning board doesn't have the information they were talking, we were talking about, they probably aren't going to vote to. So we actually can have it on the agenda and leave it on the agenda. But if we haven't done everything, we can move to dismiss it mm -hmm. at town meeting. So I, I think it would be better to have the schedule so everyone knows and then have all the information before we actually vote to lay it out. Because we, even if we vote to lay it, if we vote to lay it out and something comes up in the title research, then we may have another issue which postpones it. We need to, I think we need to have all our ducks in a row before we make the dis that decision, unless the board wishes to overrule me. We'll put it on if we run into a problem, we can pull it off after. Put it on a slate and that's it. Well, that's what I say, we put it on the agenda, we put it on the warrant for town meeting. Put it on the warrant for town meeting. But we don't vote to, to lay it out yet until we actually have all the information. It's two steps. I, th I thought tonight was going to be the vote on the declaration of intention. There is nothing, in my view, there's nothing to vote on until we actually have know what the clear vote we're taking. What is the road? Who owns the road? And how are we going to take the road? Barry Roberts owns the road. I thought that was all settled at the last meeting. Uh, we still have to do a title research on that and verify that. There was some question last at this planning board meeting last night as to whether Mr. Roberts does own the road or not. We've been waiting now three weeks just since the last <coughs> discussion when we thought that was all settled. When that Mr. Nixon reported that he had all the information that was necessary from Gary Roberts, did a survey. He was the owner. He was going to sell sell it for a song for the town. So at the planning board meeting last night, members of the planning board questioned that. They do not believe it's correct. So we will have to do a title search. So we can vote right now yeah. to start the process and say we're going to lay the road out, and that the planning board has 45 days to act. Okay. They may they may choose not to act until we finish the rest of the work, and the 45 days may, may expire, and then we'll miss town meeting. So if we wait, 
and get all our information together, then vote, then they have 45 days to vote to do their decision, and then it still makes town meeting. It still makes town meeting. We voted last night to bring the town meeting. It won't take that long to get the final search done. So at least if this starts, it didn't sound like it would take more than 45 days to do a title search on this. I mean, because we thought, he, I thought from what David said before, that he had everything he needed from Barry so, Roberts. So what Gilbert's saying is if you watch the meeting from last night, there were a couple of questions that came up relative to the possibility of conflicting title. It had to do with, it, there's a derelict deed. Is that the term of Something like that. Yeah. Right. So, so there, way. there's a quick claim deed that Barry Roberts had produced, but there, was all, there were also some evidence that some of the properties, or I don't remember how many of them, or all of them, or whatever, may have been coming in under this derelict deed rule. There was nothing we heard last night that would indicate to us that there's going to be a problem. This is more, I think, in my mind, a process and procedure question. So I, and, and where we left the meeting last night is everybody's in agreement that we want to move forward with expediting the Holly Road acceptance. Yeah. But with that said, we need to cross our T's and dot our I's. So uh, we were going back to town council for some clarification on what the best course of action was because there are a couple of different avenues we can take. And I believe, Guilford, that that's really all that's afoot right now. So you're just suggesting that we wait until some of that is Ooh. solidified and then we vote. Is that what you're? Yes. Okay. Well, if the warrant's closing though on August 26th. It can still be on the warrant. Right. If we don't get it taken care of by the time town meeting <clears throat> starts that day, we move to dismiss it. Yeah. So it gives us more time to put it on the warrant and to keep going. We don't have to have everything resolved when it closes. But you need the 45 days to happen before. Not that before the warrant. time, not before the warrant closes, no. So okay. it's actually more than 45 yeah. days that we have <laughs> once we put it on the agenda onto the town warrant. You can put it on the warrant before the planning committee's yeah. time. Yeah, we can put anything on the town warrant. <laughs> So you, you shouldn't be hearing anything pull. tonight to make you think yeah. that we're swaying from the direction we've been going. No, in. no, it's not the sway. It's, it's the frustration, honestly, that this has been going on since February, and the planning committee, the planning board knew mm -hmm. since February that this was going on. And all of a sudden, yesterday, now there's questions mm -hmm. about, you know, the derelict title, mm -hmm. and that's you know. Well, what I politely suggest so more after you know the Barry Roberts information was delivered. If, if you pay close attention to how these things work in other towns, what you may find is that these can, these types of issues can actually take years. So I think that we're actually moving fairly expeditiously on this, and everybody's in lockstep to try to do the right thing here. And, and it seemed between both boards we're going to try to fast track this as quickly as we can. But uh, their major concern was uh, out of all the properties there, if there was one property where there was a large piece of land that we needed to take that. That was more one of their 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 most concern with if someone had a problem with with us taking that piece of property if it was rather than everybody a foot or two we have to take on someone on that little corner say 10 feet of it that may cause a problem that's that that was that's what it sounded like there was at the end of the in, you you know where that little at the end, end of the road or in the middle of the road where that little turn is possibly we, we don't know. We they uh, researched the power and I guess the power went across uh, the easement for the power went across everybody's lawn on the west side of the. Uh, the power for the station comes from Mount Warner, Mount Warner and goes yes. e easterly overland yeah to to this. No, 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 the power for the house is the easement for the power, Verizon, and cable. That's on the west side. That's on the west side of the road, yeah. So it's actually moving forward. The, the, the weird thing in this whole situation is how this normally operates in other communities is the person who did the development or the property owners come forward and have all this stuff prepared ahead of time, and they present this to the town and the planning board. Um, in this case, you haven't done any of the title work, you're asking us to do the title work, 
and that's that's what's we're we're willing to do that. So it's going coming to us a different way than most of them do. And it's um, just going to be a little bit more time consuming. Well, you know, we did try to get the deeds and all, and the town couldn't find anything. Um, I, I understand. I mean, so it's moving forward, and it and, is and going to. And then once it connected the town to Barry, so, and you know, I mean, we did as much as we could, given the amount of information that was on hand. So where we are, okay. and if, if everybody's in agreement, mm -hmm. I say we, we wait, we get the schedule, and we find out how much this is going to cost us, and then we have, then we have a lot of time to make the decision. But you already voted last night to put it on the warrant. We, we did put it on the warrant, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, as long as there's no impediment to uh, the original schedule, I'm fine with that. Makes sense. You okay, Mr. Line? Mm-hmm. All right, yeah. and then Laurel Lane is moving as well, and uh, own the property. So, so the planning board received our letter, and uh, 45 days elapsed before we heard back from the planning board. Planning board did send a letter saying that uh, they they had no recommendation because they were looking for as built. Um, the next step for the select board is to decide whether Mr. Iser can produce those as built as he discussed last night. Uh, or we can uh, set a uh, public hearing date for the actual layout of the road. So we're waiting on the other one. Why don't we just keep them all together and see where we're going? I think Mr. Reiser said he was trying to find one water valve. Is all he has left to find out there? Correct. On Laurel, Laurel Drive, yeah. Isn't it hard? It's interesting. You can't find one. Probably one was put in. Maybe it's just. All right, so that's where we are with that. And <coughs> as soon as we get the updates, we'll decide whether to vote. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion on any discussion? Well, uh, just to be clear, you said among yourselves that you already voted to put it on the warrant? To put it on the town meeting warrant, yes. Okay. Isn't that the same? Is that a different step than the one you're talking about? To yes. Yes. What's the difference? Well, we also have to do a we have to let, we have to do a viewing and a laying out of the road. Yeah. So we would have to declare we would have to declare our intention to lay out the road as a public way, and then that starts the countdown for the forty five days for comments from planning board, and then in that forty five day period, we're also supposed to have a viewing of the road, and we're supposed mm -hmm. to do verify the layout and all the other little things that goes on. Yeah. So that's going to happen simultaneously, but it's already on the warrant for the fall. Yes. And if if the laying out is all in order by then, things will proceed. If it's not, then you'll withdraw it from the warrant. Is that well, yes. Good? We'll just miss it, tell me. And then, so the only thing really standing in the way probably is the town agreeing that yes, we should take the road. Okay. That's a little step. Yes, that is a step that <laughs> shouldn't be over taken lightly. All right, so it's time for our 7.15 appointment. Hello. How you doing today? I'm good, how are you guys? Good. 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 Um, I'm Tammy Campbell. I'm from Lance and Heath, and I'm the manager on the town's audit. And I'm here tonight to present the 2014 financial statements and management letter. Um, I'm just gonna give kind of a brief overview of what an audit does and does not do. A very brief overview of the financial statements and touch on some of the key numbers, um, results of operations from the year, stuff like that. Um, and then discuss the management letter unless you guys had any other thoughts on how you wanted to. No, that's fine. Um, so you know, feel free to stop me at any time if you have any questions or comments you want to make. Um, there's a we find there's a general misconception out there that when People hear the word audit, they think that we come in and we look through every single receipt that was received through the town or um, verify that every single disbursement that went through the town was processed in accordance with you know, state or federal laws and regulations or even your internal town policies. Um, and that just simply is not the case. An audit um, is not designed to verify that everything, was pro every single transaction was processed um, properly um, or 
you know, adequately record, uh, accurately recorded. Um, instead, uh, audits are conducted under a set of standards known as government auditing standards. At Melanson Heath, we feel that we go above and beyond those standards, but it's just good for you guys to know that an audit cannot and is not designed to find everything. Um, instead, audits are conducted under a concept known as materiality. Now, materiality will vary based on the size of the entity. So, for instance, the materiality for the town of Hadley will be different from the materiality for the city of Boston. In fiscal year 2014, the materiality for the town's general fund, which is your main operating fund, was about $100,000. It doesn't mean we don't look at anything below that level, because we certainly do. It just means that auditing standards say that we should design our tests to focus on transactions and balances at or above that level. Um, as part of the audit, we spend the majority of our time in the more significant or riskier departments, such as you know the treasurer's office, the collector's office, the assessor's office, and the accounting department. We perform um, internal control evaluations over your major transaction cycles. So for instance, your cash receipts cycle, your cash disbursement cycle, and your payroll cycle. And then we design procedures to test those controls to make sure they're operating effectively. So for instance, if we're told that your receivables are reconciled on a quarterly basis. Okay, well, show me December. Let me see that you've reconciled and um, the collector information agrees to the general ledger. Or that all invoices are approved before they're paid on the warrant. Okay, we'll test that and make sure that that procedure is being followed. Those are examples of tested controls. We also perform what's known as substantive testing. So to make sure that <clears throat> the numbers that are reported in the financial statements are adequately supported. So for instance, we test to make sure that the cash balances in the general ledger are supported by reconciled bank balances from the treasurer's office. Or the irreceivable balances in the general ledger are supported by detailed balance due reports from the collector office. <clears throat> so in a you know, very quick nutshell, that's what an audit kind of does and does not do and is designed to do. About that. It sure feels like you look at everything. We do look at everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we always find that one, just, you know, we only did it once, but we have a, it's like a sixth sense, an auditor sixth sense. It's a requirement for the job that we have. Yeah. <laughs> that take the right down. Yeah. I know. Um, so in terms of your, your financial statements, the thick document that, I don't know if you guys we don't want you to feel unloved. Great read. <laughs> um, yep. So the financial statements are presented under rules established by the Government Accounting Standards Board, or what we like to call GASB. The intention of GASB is to make the financial statements more meaningful and um, you know, clearer to the reader, to the readers who use those financial statements. And um, you'll see in a couple instances later that they're not always successful in doing that, but that is their intention. So um, typically there are five parts of the financial statements. There's the audit opinion, the management discussion and analysis, the government-wide financial statements, your fund basis financial statements, and then the notes of the financial statements. Now the audit opinion is the only part of the financial statements that is ours, and it comes first. Um, everything else that's recorded in the financial statements is town information that we compile in accordance with GASB standards. In 2014, we issued an unqualified opinion on your financial statements, which means that based on the results of our audit, we felt that the town was in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles, which is a good thing. Um, and we have never issued a different type of opinion for the town. Um, after the audit opinion comes the management discussion and analysis, which is like an executive summary to the financial statements. Um, so if you only have time to read a couple pages, that would be a good section to read because it gives a good overview of what's in the financial statements and some of the key results of operations for the fiscal year. Um, 
After that comes your government-wide financial statements, which if you wanted to look along, they're on pages 12 and 13. If you look on, look at page 12. Um, <coughs> the government-wide financial statements are Gadsby's attempt of taking a governmental operations and showing it like a business, which not really is meaningful to the users of the financial statements, such as yourselves. Um, because you don't operate like a business. You can't raise revenue like a business. You can't budget like a business. So, you know, their intention is good, but they're just not as meaningful as the fund basis financials, which we'll look at later. Um, you know, the bond rating agencies don't spend a lot of time with these financial statements because they're just, they're not how you set your tax rate. You know, you can't, you can't do that type of, uh, those type of procedures with these financial statements. What, they do, what these financial statements do is they take in your governmental activities column there all the, all the town funds, so your general fund, your special revenue funds, your capital project funds, your trust funds, consolidate them into one column and then add things like your fixed assets or your long-term debt like bonds payable or your other post-employment benefit liability. So, you know, in a way, it shows the true assets and liabilities of the town, but like I said, you can't really do anything with that. You can't say, oh, I need to raise more money to cover this, this huge OPEB liability because it's not, it's not how things are run. So um, if you look about three quarters of the way down, you'll see that net OPEB obligation. That represents the town's <coughs> liability at June 30th, 14, which is about $4.1 million. Um, a couple years ago, Gatsby required the towns to obtain an actuarial study to determine what their other post-employment benefit liability, un, you know, unfunded liability was. And they were nice enough to say, well, okay, you have this huge liability, we'll let you add it to your financial statements over a 30-year period. So you obtain the actuarial study, amortize it over 30 years, and a little bit gets added every single year. So that's a you know, culmination of what's been added over the past four or five years. Um, the town has established an OPEP trust fund and at the end of 2014 had a little over $120,000 in that fund. Um, that balance is not netted against its liability. It's shown separately in the financial statements. Um, it's required to be reported separately. And rate setting, rate setting agencies look favorably upon town setting, this, setting up the OPEP trust fund. Because they want you, they want to see that you're showing initiative. You know that liability is out there, and you're attempting to fund it. No one is fully funding it by any stretch of the imagination, but they want to see that you're making, you know, an effort to put money away to fund the liability. Their, you know, opinion might change in a few years, and you know, they might say you have to start funding it more aggressively. But for right now, they're they just want to see that money is being set aside, and a trust fund has been set up. So. So the town is doing that, and I'm sure you put more money in since then, but we're looking back at 14. So, um, effective for the fiscal year 2015 audit, Gatsby issued a new standard, Gatsby 68, and they are going to require the town, all the cities and towns, to book the unfunded pension liability associated with the um, retirement system. So, for you guys, it would be Hampshire County Retirement System. Now, if you look on the last page of the financial statements, page 47. Can I just ask yeah. what that actually means? We belong to a Hampshire pension system. We have to book the unfunded liability of the entire system? No. Nope. Or our portion? Your share. Thank yes. You. Yes. No. Um, so if you look on page. <laughs> yeah, right. 181 million, that's not. Yeah. Um, so. On page 47 in the, the middle table there, that is the results of the actuarial valuations in the last page, yep. um, for the retirement system. <coughs> in that middle column, that unfunded AAL, the actuarial accrued liability, that $181 million represents the unfunded liability for the entire retirement system. Now, if you wanted to do kind of a rough quick calculation of what your liability might look like, if you look at the bottom right hand corner of that page, it shows the town's contributions as a percent of actual contributions. In fiscal year 14, 
the town's retirement assessment letter represented about four and a half percent of the total of all the assessment letters that the retirement system sent out for that year. So four and a half percent of that $181 million is about $8.1 million. Now, Gatsby's kind of, they're not as nice as they used to be. They're going to require you to book that entire liability in one shot. You're not going to get to amortize it over you know, a period of time like the OPEB liability. That $8.1 million is going to show up as a liability next year on your financial statements. So things are going to get ugly everywhere. Um, they're not, again, they're not, you know, you have a funding schedule with the retirement system, so it's being funded in that way, but they want people to be aware that there's this liability out there, and currently no one, no one has it on their books. So the retirement system is not their liability, per se. It belongs to all the towns. So um, the actuaries for the Hampshire County Retirement System are in the process of figuring out how much of that unfunded liability belongs to each town. So um, they're currently working on that right now. It's not just going to be the four and a half percent. This is other factors. But so that's going to make us have two separate huge liabilities. All right, but so we got OPED, and now we're going to have now you're going to have the unfunded pension liability as well. On wow, our, I hope we get on a the government tree line. in town we can <laughs> pick from. Wow, everyone needs that. Yeah. I, I think just to clarify, the unfunded liability for the pension system by law they have to uh, uh, come up with a 20 or 25 year. Yeah. Uh, pay down schedule. This is uh, required by law, and, and all cities and towns have been working under that system for many years. So we, have, there is a system in place for addressing that. Right. It's supposed to be what 2040. It's supposed to be fully funded. Right. Something like that. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Dead fight. Yeah. I don't think it's 2044. <laughs> this system. Right. <laughs> for Hatcher County. For Hatcher County. Yeah. Okay. What did they extend? Did they extend? Because it was no, no, no. They didn't yeah. extend during the okay. recession. Okay. Um, so, so next year have that huge liability on to the show up in the government bank, government fund government sorry excuse me government wide financial statements. Um, and because the pen, unfunded pension liability is very similar to the in a lot of ways the OPEB um, liability. In a couple of years, Gatsby is expected to come out and say, you're no longer allowed to amortize the OPEB over 30 years, you're going to have to book the whole thing at once. So I would imagine in a couple of years from now, I'll be sitting here saying, you know, next year you will be, you will show the entire $7.6 million OPEB liability on your books. But, um, so some more good news. We should just get rid of Gatsby. Uh, I'm all in agreement with that. Um, the impact of booking the yes. unfunded, just putting that not just our town, all towns. What, yeah. what does it really mean for us going forward, other than seeing it, that big number there? What is it? What does it mean? Something will be more difficult with our borrowing, or I don't think so, because everyone is going to have that liability there, and there's nothing that can really be done about it. Um, you know, I think they're going for shopping. Talking well back there here. It's like okay. there's this, yeah, there's this liability out there, and someone needs to recognize it. I mean, we've been looking at it for the last couple yeah. of years, but from what I understand, there's a lot of towns that are just ignoring it completely. That's there's only one town in Massachusetts that has funded it. Fully funded it, yeah. yeah, right. And very, very few are even anywhere close to fully funding it. There are, you know, depending on the financial situation of some towns, they are putting more money, you know, aside for it, but. Once it's in there, it really can only be used for that purpose, unlike a stabilization fund, you know, that you can take it out for other purposes. So, you know, I'm a fan of putting money aside for it, but not like get going crazy over, you know, trying to fund it completely. Can't afford it. You know, no one can. I mean, can't afford it. It's just not, not a thing. Right. Right. I mean, I, I think it is political, yeah. you know, and I think it is about shopping law, and it is being used to put pressure on public pension systems. Yeah. And the um, post, post office is the one place where they require, right, the yeah. full OPEB yeah. funding, and it's being used to kind of crush the post office. So I, right. you know, I think it is something to watch in terms of the political intention. Yeah, I don't know if they're trying to get people to say, well, there's this huge liability out there, you know, maybe you shouldn't 
pay so much, maybe towns shouldn't pay so much of their retirees health insurance. I think they're trying to affect behavior. They are, yeah. <laughs> and it's unfortunate because, you know, yes. that's really not the goal, I don't think they're going to but it's there, everyone's going to have it. You know, I don't think right now the bond rating agencies are going to look unfavorably upon it, you know, and it's something that just needs to be booked. So mm -hmm. I just wanted you guys to be aware that that's just coming down there. Well, the same thing as Social Security. They're pushing your date out to retire. They're hoping you all die before yeah. you get yeah, to yeah. what your Social Security. <laughs> Not holding that hope for that. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, Award. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's really all I had for the the government wide financials. Do you have any other questions? And then we move on to the fund basis financials, which are on which is fourteen and sixteen. Um, so if you look at page 14, um, like I said, these are your fund basis financials. So they're more in line to what you guys are used to looking at, what Gail's used to working with, um, with the exception of a few things, thanks to Gatsby again. Um, that first column there, that general fund, uh, back in 2011, Gatsby decided that in order to make cities and towns comparable to state, governments that they needed to book the stabilization fund with your general fund. So that column right there, even though it says general fund, is really your general fund plus your stabilization fund. The reasoning behind that was the states have their rainy day funds, which are tracked in their general fund. And in Gazi's mind, you know, your rainy day fund is essentially your stabilization fund. So why not group it with your general fund? And we'll just label it general so people don't understand that. But So that, that column right there is um, one of the reasons why we love Gatsby. The bottom number, the unassigned fund balance number there of about $2.9 million. $2.1 million of that is the balance in the town stabilization fund at the end of the year. That represents about 14% of the town's annual budget, which you know, the recommended range is somewhere between 7 and 10 percent, so you guys have a very healthy stabilization fund. Um, certainly, you've done a good job setting money aside in there. The remaining 800000 or so of that balance is your unassigned, undesignated, unreserved, what other unword can I think of, um, balance in, in your general fund. So it's money that's not been set aside or reserved for other purposes. <coughs> That is essentially like the starting point for the DOR's free cash calculation, if you want to think of it that way. That, the balance of about 800000 is about 6% um, of the town's annual budget, which is a little on the low side, but considering the town is so much in the stabilization fund, it's certainly nothing I'm worried about or concerned about. Um, and it you know, can ebb and flow depending on what projects you have and what, how much free cash you use every year. Um, so that's really the, the, the key numbers on there. Um, Tom, can I just ask a question? Yeah. Um, the capital project fund, there's a deficit in the unassigned. Is that just in anticipation of future borrowing? Yeah. That it's a, okay. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so you spent the money, but you hadn't borrowed at that point in time, so the revenue hadn't come in to fund mm -hmm. that, so, yeah. Um, another thing I did want to point out is the second column there, the water fund. For town purposes, for your purposes, it's considered an enterprise fund. For financial reporting purposes, thanks to Gatsby, we report it as a governmental fund. So it's shown in your government wide thing, or your governmental fund financial statements. <coughs> the reason for that is other than accounting standards say that enterprise funds are meant to cover the entire cost of the fund. And because the general fund pays a portion of the water enterprise fund debt. It doesn't cover all its costs, and therefore we cannot show it as an enterprise fund on the financial statements. Does it change how you guys budget, how you do anything, or from your end, it's it's an enterprise fund. But just from our financial reporting end, we are required to show it there. Um, so you'll see here, you'll see later that the sewer is the only fund shown as an enterprise fund in, in the financial statements. But like I said, other than just showing it separately, it has no effect on the town whatsoever. Um, after that, 
comes the notes of the financial, financial statements, which just provide some more detailed information on some of the numbers that can be found <coughs> on those financial pages. Unless anyone had any other questions on the financial statements. No. It's a good read if you guys ever need help going to bed some night. All the 40 or so pages there. Okay. <coughs> Now, next I was going to discuss the management letter, which I was told you know, before I came in here when I met with um, the treasurer and the accountant that, that none of these issues would be repeated next year, right? Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hopefully not. Um, so, in terms of the management letter, comment number one, we've kind of repeated in some fashion since we started doing the audit. Um, <coughs> this year, we classify it as a material weakness, um, which means that based on our testing, we felt that there was a deficiency in the internal control, internal control structure that um, was so big that a material misstatement could occur and not be detected. Um, that's kind of the definition of a material weakness. So there's no, there aren't enough other compensating controls in place that would prevent something material from from occurring and, and not being discovered. Um, you know, last year the treasurer was still using a manual cash book, um, hadn't taken the steps to convert it to Excel or QuickBooks or any other fashion, which I know currently has been remedied, so that will no longer be an issue going forward. Um, and there wasn't really a, a true reconciliation occurring with that cash book to the GL thought there was, but you know, when you really looked at the actual balances, it didn't appear that that was occurring, um, similar to prior years. Um, during, our, during our audit, it was brought to our attention that there were nine bank accounts that weren't um, either in the cash book or in the town's general ledger. These were made up of scholarship accounts or um, like escrow uh, deposit accounts, so there isn't a whole lot of activity in there other than interest in, you know, once a year they cut checks in the scholarship accounts, but um, but still every single account that's in control of the treasurer should be in the cash book and therefore should be in the general ledger. Again, I don't think this will be an issue going forward, um, but, you know, it was brought up during the audit, so. What are the nine accounts? John, Jonathan Edwards, 350th? No, 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 no. Um, they are. They are Yes, there's four uh, accounts that the school, uh, in individual names, uh, scholarships. So people donated money for a particular person's scholarship and opened an account, and uh, the statements are coming to the treasurer's office, and as she says, they gain interest, and we send a check over once a year to pay those scholarships. So uh, there were a number of them which were, um, they were uh, deposits made by developers th uh, for the, uh, in lieu of a performance bond with the planning board um, to assure that um, roads were finished. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Com completion. Um, I'm told by planning board because of the changes in, uh, that the town has made in allowing the um, building inspector to withhold what the uh, occupancy or their business certificates that they no longer need to ha have this money set aside. But And several of them have closed out this year, uh, three of them in the past couple months, and I think we only have two of those left. Any on the four roads we spoke of earlier? Any on the four ro roads that we spoke of earlier? Bayberry? Gooseberry. <coughs> Gooseberry? No. I don't think so. Okay. No. Thank you. No, these are, Birch these are ongoing current developments, they, like, uh, as in uh, businesses. Thank you. Um, the next bullet had to do with, um, during our audit testing, we found an instance where a deposit that went to the bank, it was um, state money, uh, quarterly money, went into the bank but never um, never made it to the general ledger. So there was about $30,000 that, because there wasn't good processes and controls in place, or really good reconciliation, and this happened in November 2013, and it didn't surface until the audit uh, in March. So if there had been a 
adequate reconciliation in place, it would have shown up in November 2013. So um, that was discovered, and it's since been booked in the general ledger. And, um, and my understanding is cash receipts and cash disbursements are being reconciled on a monthly basis now. So that should not happen again as well. Um, there's also some adjustments that were the need to get made to the student activity fund. Um, balances in the general ledger, so I don't know if you're aware of how student activity fund works, but the school has control of the checking account and the treasurer has control of the savings account. All the deposits go in the savings account and the school has a, a certain threshold that they're allowed to have in the, in the checking account. So for instance, say it's $25,000. They're allowed to spend that down, and then when they run low on money, they make a request to the town to replenish that account. <clears throat> that request should be processed through a warrant, just like any other check that's cut from the town. What happened was the request got made to the treasurer, funds got transferred, but it didn't go on the warrant. So therefore, the money got moved, and the balance in the student activity fund account, therefore did not agree to the balance in the general ledger for the student activity fund account, because it never got processed you know, through the warrant. Um, again, that's been remedied and reconciled, and pretty confident that will not happen again as well. And that was school again also? It was from the school side, but it was a result of something that the, the treasurer had, had done. Because um, the school sent the information over, but they, I don't know if they would necessarily know that it didn't, or did go on a warrant, um, so I don't, I, yeah, I'm not sure about that. <coughs> um, we also found that three times in the month of July, a direct deposit um, transfer was rejected for the payroll, which didn't result in anyone not getting paid, because you clearly would have heard about that. Um, but it just had to do with timing around holidays and stuff after should have got done you know, a day earlier and stuff like that. So just more care needs to be taken to make sure that that is done in a timely fashion. Um, and the last comment had to do with, um, you know, since we came out for the audit, cash had not been reconciled, um, which is, you know, kind of a relative term because cash wasn't really truly reconciled as of June, but no formal process had really taken place since since June, um, which is concerning because, you know, for us, that's the you have cash and you have receivables; those are your two assets, and those, you know, really need to be reconciled. Cash monthly and receivables at least quarterly. So, <coughs> um, so those are the reasons we felt it was a material weakness this year. But I'm pretty confident that that will not be an issue next year. So. Um, the second comment had to do with our um, internal control testing over the vendor disbursements, and this is where I was saying that we always find that one little issue <laughs> that you know that seems to slip through, but as part of the audit, we test 25 vendor disbursements from throughout different times during the year, paid by different departments, um, charged to different funds. We just randomly select um, different invoices. And we trace those invoices to make sure that um, there's proper approval on it, that the warrants were signed by the board. Um, right? Um, there's proper approval there make sure that the invoice was charged to a, a reasonable expense account, um, that the check that was cut agreed to the invoice, and um, just that the invoice looked reasonable, wasn't paid from a copy or a fax, um, didn't look like something was made on somebody's home computer, you know, things along those lines, just to make sure that everything looked reasonable. Um, during the testing, we found um, two instances where we felt that the supporting documentation for the payment was not adequate. Um, one of them had to do with a payment of deputy collector fees. Um, when the collector submits for payment of the, collector, of the deputy collector fees, she just did a bills payable summary saying, you know, please pay this person, the deputy collector, this much money. Um, what we like to see is when the, when the deputy collector turns over the money to the collector, they give her a schedule saying, okay, this is what we collected in motor vehicle excise, that's your money. This is what we collect in our fees. Please basically turn around and pay that back to us. So that should really be used as the back supporting documentation um, as opposed to like a, a typed note from the collector's office, which I'm you know, sure it agrees, but it's just a little more accurate and um, 
better documentation. I, mean, I talked to Gail about that during, after the audit, and you know, I think there's a new process. I'm in using place. their turnovers. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. That's what I've been doing. Yeah, tax return. Yeah, that's perfect. <clears throat> so that one will be there. Sure. Um, we also found we tested a credit card payment, and for credit mm -hmm. cards, we like to see the supporting documentation for the payments that were made with the credit card. Um, and we did find one instance where there was a payment um, to, I think, like the Gazette recorder for advertising that didn't have um, an invoice attached, so. They're actually hard to get. They are very hard to get, like, uh, an invoice from the Gazette. Yeah. That, that one was from my number, but I'm a guilty party here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. So. Um, so not like a huge, not really huge issues, but because we found two in the 25, we selected, you have to extrapolate that to the population, and you know, that's where you get this mix and efficiency. Right. Um, and then similar to prior years, the invoices that were being paid from the school didn't have um, handwritten approval on them. I think their process and procedure over there um, used to be, a, I guess it's since changed, but the accounts payable clerk would compile and receive all the invoices and then put them on a warrant and if she had any questions she would contact the, the department or whoever was in charge of the invoice. But I mean, really the invoices should be going directly to the person responsible for purchasing the goods or procuring the services so they can make sure that yeah that's that's what we bought or yeah that person did come and speak or that's whatever. What, that's what we received. Yeah. Right. Yeah exactly. Um, not just relying on the accounts payable clerk to you know double check with people um, to make sure that that happens. So I did speak to them as well since the audit and they have modified their procedures so that the invoices are going to the department heads or whoever's responsible for the purchase, they're going to sign them and then send them back. So check. <coughs> um, comment number three came from um, an internal control review that we did in the inspections office. Um, we went in and looked at the controls over the cash receipt cycle in that department. So we looked to make sure that <clears throat> the cash receipts from the time when they come in the door to the time they get turned over to the treasurer are properly handled. You know, permitting permits, especially in that department, are being tracked properly, things along that line. Um, so what we, what we found was that there were receipt logs being kept for the gas and the plumbing inspectors um, permits and receipts, but not necessarily for the building inspectors. There was a form and a process in place. It just it wasn't a running receipt log that um, tracked things and you know subtotal when we get turned over. So uh, that was a pretty easy fix. You basically just copied what was being done for the other inspectors and is going to be going, doing that going forward for the building inspector. So um, so that should be taken care of as well. Um, and because it's a small office and there's really one person in charge of collecting the receipts and entering the permits into the system and then turning the money over to the treasurer, there's really no controls over that process. Um, so we talked for a little while about what, what can be done that's reasonable because, I mean, we don't want to say, oh, you got to hire someone else because you need someone else in here. You know, it just doesn't make sense. But the key control in that department is the permitting system. If somebody does not go in the permitting system, they are not going to be issued a permit. If they gave you money and they're not in the permitting system, you're going to hear about it. So the key control is, in my mind, is the permitting system. So we agreed at the end of every month that a report would be printed from that system and compared to the general ledger receipts to make sure that all the money collected made it into the general ledger and therefore made it to the treasurer's office as well. Um, of course, this cannot be done by the clerk, considering she would be the one who's doing facilitating the process. So, the inspectors would be the ones that would be reviewing, comparing that to make sure everything's accounted for. So, there was there an agreement there. So, <coughs> in terms of the other issues, it's just a couple <coughs> small, um, couple small things. The town received a um, state 911 equipment grant last year. And um, the stipulation of the grant says that you can purchase the equipment and we'll reimburse you 75%. As a town, you need to come up with the other 25% to cover the costs. 
Um, I don't think that was really communicated very well when the grant was um, was written or you know when the equipment was bought. So at the end of the year, when the equipment was purchased, the money from the grant had come in, but the town hadn't funded their share. So you ended up with a deficit in that fund, um, which you know you later funded by a uh, town meeting appropriation. But it just proper planning would have been good to know, you know, the time the grant was received or the um, the equipment was purchased that the town was going to need to fund that money. You could have gotten away without having a deficit in the fund, which hit your free cash. You know, it's only five thousand dollars, but it still reduced your free cash. So, so um, proper planning there. Um, and the last is to establish an internal audit function. Um, like I mentioned before, we did a departmental review of the inspections office as part as um, part of the town accountant's duties. You know, they should be doing one or two departmental reviews like that um, on a yearly basis. And I know it's usually a matter of, of time and um, resources that um, prevent that from happening. We've seen that in you know, other places as well. But um, the key would be to just do a surprise visit to a department um, you know, once or twice a year. <coughs> Let them know you, you could be doing it. Keep them on their toes. You know, that, just knowing that might deter you know, something from from happening, but it, you know, Gail would go in and look at the the same kind of things we did. The controls with the cash receipts. Okay, your receipt log says you have a hundred dollars. You have a hundred dollars in your drawer. Please tell me it's not sitting on the counter somewhere. You know, you're stamping. <laughs> Never. It's in my pocket. It's in your pocket. Yeah, that's great. Um, the cash is not the checks, right? Um, the checks are stamped right away when they're received, so they can't be endorsed by someone else. You know, things along that line. Um, so that's. Tanya, on the um, last recommendation for other towns, uh, is everybody doing it in-house or are there other towns that are going to outsource that function? Typically, they, they do it in-house. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know many other towns that, that would hire someone out, outside mm -hmm. to do it. A lot of times, um, if there's an assistant in the department, they'll do it, or even like the treasurer's office works in conjunction with the accounting office to um, to go together and do it and, and go count the receipts and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's it's not too cumbersome, but it, it does take time, and you have to you know document that you've done it because as an auditor, if you tell me you did it, unless I see proof, I don't believe you. No, don't. Not trusting. Um, but so it needs to be documented and things like that. So it, it does take a little bit, a little bit of time. But I think once there's a procedure in place, it won't. So my question was on the grant we got. So this is kind of the second time we've had a little grant issue come up. So when we get grants, the question I have is, do we book that as in a capital account? and no expenses are made, no purchases are made until it's booked Un in. Unfortunately, it's a reimbursable, so you've got to spend the money and then get the money And then back. get the reimbursement. It's still a, it's a grant. Yeah. And my, the auditor can jump in on me any time, but as a grant, it should be booked in as a grant, as the amount of money that's there to be spent, and that this is the amount that's eligible for spending. You spend it, and it becomes a liability, and then you ask for reimbursement, and then you wipe it out. That would be full accrual basis accounting, which the town does not really do. Um, I think, I don't know what the I process is the, for... But I think part of the problem was, I just got the sheet saying that we got the grant, right. and nowhere on that right. sheet said it, it was say. 70. I need to get the entire grant, and if well, I had seen that, I would have said something. Isn't it the state standard contract we get for all our grants from the state now? You should. And what we've seen in other places is that the, I don't know how you apply for grants or, you know, what happens when you're awarded a grant, but if the select board is aware of that and you get a copy of the grant agreement, at least at that point in time, you'll know, okay, we have to come up with 25% of this, so let's, how are we going to do it, you know? How, so is it going to be funded by the department's budget? They have the available money in the general fund that can be used to fund that. You know, at least then you have time to plan it. So I don't know. I don't know what the process is for departments. And so I guess from my point of view on that, we need to take a look at how to do that because yep. we've yeah. done this twice yeah. now in a year, yeah. and, and 
this one was small, the second one was very big in comparison to what we have issues with. Um, and we, because we should get a contract from the state for every grant and it has to be signed by us. And then it should be booked in that that's the amount that's available and only that amount is spent. Um, and to tell the truth, I don't remember seeing either one of those grants. Grant. But are we supposed to do that when we apply for the grant or when the grant is granted? Not when it's awarded. When, it's awarded. when I saw the award, it was for the entire amount. But did you see? I'm sorry. Did yeah, it was like twenty nine thousand when it only came back at twenty five. But it we said were, yeah. so. You saw a sheet of paper that said you're going to award a grant for twenty nine thousand. It's a seventy five percent reimbursement. Say 75%. So um, that that sheet of paper to the state of Massachusetts means nothing. You can take it into the restroom if you run out of other stuff. That's all that piece of paper will do for you. There's a contract that comes, and I'm sorry I said it that way. That's what I think about that. Um, <clears throat> there's a contract that comes that's signed with a, a signature from the state and has to be signed by the town. That's the one that gets you your money back. And that's the only piece of paper that gets you money back. So do, do we actually see that, sh those two, that sheet of paper? I don't think Gail got that. So I don't know what the process is. Yeah, Maybe so like we need the, the departments yeah, need to make the select board aware. You know, we're applying for this grant. Here are the stipulations. We're going to get this much money, but the town has to fund this much. And you know, not every grant has a, a match component to it. Right. But I mean, I would, I would think you would want to be aware. Like, we're going to purchase equipment with this grant, so. It's an internal control. Yeah, so we just right. need to kind of. <laughs> so I mean, it's just. Better, commu no better communication, probably. Because I have no issue with Chapter 90 because it's right on right. the state yeah, website, nice. and I keep track of it on an Excel spreadsheet so I know we don't go over. <coughs> well, can but we just put this at a, at a yeah, subsequent we, meeting? Yes. And, you know, sometimes so, police and fire right. do grants yep. with in their own department, and we don't always know until they're I think awarded. That's what, I think that one was a so we need to take a measure for nine for a dispatch. So we need to look at those too because I think the only people who can obligate the town for Absolutely. a grant is us, the select board. So we should have known. Yeah. We should have known a little more about it, and that does fall to us. And that that was that these two. Well, the big one was the one that's been bothering the most. And so I is read that a fifteen the, issue? Probably yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh. But we resolved it. Okay. You'll find it, out about it. Actually, yeah, right. okay. it's not an issue because we didn't get the grant and we just funded it out of capital, so uh, it's not right. an issue. Keep it in your mind to look for it. It's another issue. <laughs> that's, a, that's a different issue. It's a very different issue. <laughs> right. um, but, well, I know two of my departments, I've had grants from them, and they tell me right up front it was, it's a 50 50. Mm -hmm. And they tell me where that 50% is coming from. Yeah. This one, I think it just got in between everything. So I think that's one thing we have as a select board because we are responsible for those and we have to sign for those agreements with the state. Well, to be honest with you, I mean, what I what I'd like to see all of this expanded to, and obviously, you know, there've been some significant changes, you know, as you pointed yeah. out internally. So I mean, have confidence that we aren't going to have repeats on this. But it's one thing to be confident about it, and the other, it's another thing to force reporting on it. So I mean, I I think that. All of this is leading towards we need to have um, really <coughs> policy. But we'll bolster our reporting between us and the accountant right. and the town right. treasurer. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Because there hasn't, if there was adequate oversight by the select board, having, I mean, it's appalling to me to have this sort of repeat. Yeah. I mean, it's really not okay. But the select board, we haven't had a mechanism and a formal mechanism in place to say to the town treasurer and the town accountant, please come and let us know right. where you're at with reconciliations and all of this stuff, so just so we can have assurances it's being done. That's true, but you also have an elected treasurer. <coughs> true. Yes. So, I mean, really, you can bring the townspeople in here and they can um, you know, hold them accountable. But um, as a board, you, you don't have as much control over an elected official. We can't control it, but we can ask the question. You can. You can. Checks right. and balances. Yeah, you can, but they, they're not required to report Correct. to the board. They might want to. They, no, they I agree. Do. And, you know, I fully support that. I think they should, but, you know, it depends where you go and who you have. And if, if there are any other um, 
best practices, for lack of a better way to put it, mm -hmm. relative to this. I mean, we would mm -hmm. love, I, I would, I would love to speak for myself, but right. I, think, I think our whole board would love right. to hear how other towns maybe accomplish this, just to make sure, again, that there's some level of oversight when you have these elected positions. Communication. Yeah, I mean, just through communication. And we not knowing that this needed to be done either. Not knowing that, you know, Mike should have brought forth, you know, a grant, then we were supposed to match it. Seventy-five well, percent you were going to get. I mean, you know, this is just a matter of us being aware now yeah. that this needs to be done. To be so we must. I think we assumed it for too long. Yeah. Is what she's trying to say. There, there's been multi-year grants too that that we kept a pretty good eye on. You know, mm -hmm. that we've got over the years. So, any other comments, uh, questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just one general question. I mean, again, you're in and out of a lot of towns, mm -hmm. small towns in particular, yeah. always staffing is fraught with danger because we're, you know, spread so thin. But yeah, um, would you imagine that we could benefit? It sounds like you're recommending that we have more hours, for lack of a better way to put it, put into some of these financial functions. I mean, specifically the internal controls you've identified. Yeah. Um, that certainly would help in, in some ways. I don't, there aren't, you're, you don't have a lot of internal control issues, but there are a couple that could be addressed, and I would think that, you know, offering the more hours would allow that um, to some degree. I certainly think that. Um, you know, every town's a little bit different, and some people want more hours, and some people don't want more hours. You know, it's kind of. You want more hours to get it paid more, no. right? So. Yeah. No, no, I've got two other towns. No. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you know, certainly Joan could do an internal, like, the internal reviews. Yeah, or, we could get you, know, like, you know, she's fully capable. She's familiar with all the departments and would would be able to do that successfully. So there's, you know, there's those options other than Gail, who, you know, it's for. Gail, did you and Linda have any comments you wanted to? Oh, I... I, I actually do think we can use more hours, but I think that that's going to take us a little bit of time to develop because it's hard right now to tell the mm -hmm. number of hours are they going into learning, catching up, changing systems, or are they an ongoing need of hours? So I, we, we're really and I've said that this out. Ten hour position, but right now until I get a second computer, it doesn't work because all I'd be doing is sitting, swiggling my thumbs, and with the move over to um, doing the asbestos project, it's going to be hard enough putting us all in there, let alone having another person. So hopefully, you know, once that's all done, we can sit down and seriously get the needs so I can have that 10 hour assistant. All right. And I would think if you want to set up something, whether it's quarterly or whatever, on a regular basis, to have all the financial people come in and, and talk of, and address what these issues, I don't, you know, elected or appointed, I think that everyone has an interest in bringing this information out um, if wanted. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Okay. Is there someone here about net metering? That would be. All right, we'll skip that one. For a little bit. So. So mass. Actually, Mike, are you here to talk about net mass dot? Well, they're scheduled to come in. I believe the first meeting in July to speak to us about the Route Nine project. A couple things that were brought to light. I believe the board has copies of them. One was the letter <coughs> that I request a waiver from the control density fill for the town of Hadley for the second section of roadway over here. I won't get into the letter so much, but they're requesting uh, testing of the uh, density of the soil, doing proctor testings, and they're requiring 97% compaction on the, on the trench that if we did not use flow will fill on and they want to use uh, by nuclear methods so it uh, i talking to the state about this basically i don't think it's going to be much of a cost savings not to use flow will fill 
<coughs> compared to using global bill after we have to hire someone to do all this testing if there's actually a different soil type as we're going through the trench that house also has to be tested through a proctor and they want that every hundred feet so that's something we can talk to the state about when they show up at the first meeting of July another issue that was brought to light that I believe the board has copies of is the plantings that they are requesting the town to uh, actually they have a state access form filled out but not signed of course for the town of Hadley which I'll describe it it says planting beds being constructed as part of the project one planting bed at each of the four corners of the intersections of Route 9 and 47. I believe you have some information from the Historical Commission on that, dating back a few years that the Historical Commission requested some plantings in that area. Now who's going to take care of that, Mike? And part of that agreement... Guilford, he's doing it for Anderson, the road found it out. Very well, too. Part of the agreement <laughs> is that the town has to agree to maintain this. Basically, the guy in the loader in January and will trim him. The trim him. <clears throat> Forever. So basically, what it boils down to is a different uh, type of planting that they want, that the Historical Commission wanted. When they show up at our next meeting, the first meeting in July, we should bring that up and ask them. We actually, David and I, spoke to uh, David Bly about this at length, about the planting, and he said that it was something that the town requested be done. Uh, through the Historic Commission? Correct. But not the select board or anybody else? No, that's why we're bringing it here. Uh, this was, the, this was the, when we had our meeting with the Mass DOT. Uh, this, this stuck out like a sore thumb, and I thought that uh, we should bring this to the select board's attention in advance of your meeting with uh, the Mass DOT in order to see if you, what your thoughts were about this. Uh, it, it would require a commitment on the part of the town to uh, maintain the plantings. Um, we have the example up in Sunderland where you have the intersection of 116 and 47. Town doesn't take care of that though. The town okay. has a volunteer who ha handles that. Looks beautiful, but there's line of sight issues. There is. Plantings are, mm -hmm. are high. Enough. In Sunderland? Yeah. In yeah. Sunderland. How do we make out with the black ornamental light posts? They look nice. What about the ornamental light posts? That's what I'm asking how we made out with that as opposed to the planting. I believe that's part of what is on their design of what they want to do at the intersection. The showing, I believe the board has a copy. I cut this off of this and made copies of it of what they wanted planted. Who was, repeat that again, who was that? They? The state is the person that designed this in conjunction with approval from the historical same one that wanted sidewalks and the poor people can't walk on the sidewalks in the winter because they push all the snow on top of the sidewalks? Correct. So the chair of the Historic Commission who requested this isn't there anymore? Correct. Here's Marla Miller again. So we're meeting with them on July 1st. So I will try to, I will reach out to the new chair and ask if they still I still wish to have this, and then what their, if they still wish to have it, what their plan is for making this kind of work a little better, and then we'll have some more information before the July 1st meeting. I'm sorry, Gilbert, who is the chair? Is it um, Ginger? Ginger. Yeah. I kind of had an idea. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, we have several businesses in town that um, I'm wondering if that would they would like to. Um, I was going to run it by the board if they would like to um, do the plantings maintain a corner. and maintain the corner and maintain the, um, since I don't think anybody right now is maintaining the sign as they come into Hadley. Mm -hmm. um, we did have someone that did a great job, and unfortunately she has moved out of town. I'm not sure. She used to have some help. I'm not sure where that is at this point. She moved out of town too. So 
my thoughts were is if we maybe approached um, some local people with businesses that they may want to you know do the plantings and then they could put a sign saying in um, naming their business as uh, maintained, maintained by so and so and maybe that you know that would be nice for them to do that and maybe we could do that on a yearly basis if we wanted to rotate it or you can even do service organizations too service organizations. sometimes you'll see like you know Kiwanis or Kiwanis Boy Scouts or, or you know Eagle Scouts or somebody that wants a project or so do, so do we want to keep the plannings and the plans for now and then work on trying to get volunteers and all due respect, this letter says that came to Marla Miller from Mr. Massey, or went there, says that the suggestion in your letter concerning the space for ornamental flower beds would also be welcome, as though it sounds like Mr. Massey's suggestion of the flower beds. Uh, Paragraph 2, section, line 2. Well, regardless of what they're, they're not known for being very yeah. planting <laughs> oriented. We would need to have a plan, so... Uh, but I mean, like Joyce, I mean, I, I'm not opposed to it being looking good. With our experience with them planting it? sidewalks on the side of the highway and covering them up with five feet of snow, I would say put grass and we would have to talk to the Historical Commission right. again. So I will talk to the Historical Commission. If you want to talk to some of the um, people, uh, contractors who do landscaping and see how they uh, accept that, then we'll have more information for the first, and then we'll go from there. Do we need to talk about the waterline project? How far we're going to go? Have we finalized what we want to do with the waterline project on this? I think that, I believe, David, you have an article for a fall town meeting for that. Right, so, so we know we have to raise money and we're going to have to borrow mo uh, money for uh, this water line project. Uh, you have the project replacement of the water line within the mass DOT project areas, which is from Wally Street to just about where the farm museum is. And we have a price of $425,000. You're not going all the way to East Street? So that's the first part of it. The second part of it would be an additional $800,000 to take the line outside of the Mass DOT project area from the Farm Museum to East Street uh, and replace that line there. Um, we're going to have to do some financial planning about this because um, under both cases we're going to have to borrow the money and the water rates are going to have to support the, the debt. Um, and I put together a couple of borrowing scenarios and passed some of it out to the folks downstairs, but I'm just going to pass this along. The first one shows the project area um, uh, only for 425, and the first payment would be 35550 declining to 29,000 in the second year and then declining down to a final payment after 20 years of 21,600. Um, that's at 2% interest under the state SRF borrowing. The second uh, scenario shows the entire project at 1,225,000. That's the project area plus the extension. Um, and the uh, first payment would be 93,000 $300 at 2% interest. Um, and I think that we need to look at what our water receipts are, the timing of water billing, uh, and make some decisions about the scope of the project uh, based upon affordability as well as the practical matter of, of the need to replace that line, which is how, how old? Oh, very old. Older than Almost 100 eight. years. So. Older than dirt. There's a lot of water breaks on it. <laughs> the Mass Highway is not planning to do that section this year. Within five years. We talked We talked with them and they talked about five years out. We said, can we be more flexible with that schedule? And they didn't make a commitment, obviously, but they did say maybe they could do that section in two or three years. So if we had our work done, they would probably consider it a little bit quicker than if it wasn't done. 
I think that's something that you should raise with Mass DOT when they come here. Yeah. In July, July 1st. Okay, right. now you've just changed it. We were looking at a bank loan at 2% originally. And yes, now SRF. And no, are, are we able to get that SRF fund for 2% or not? We would have to apply for it. Um, and if we don't get it, what happens? Because we went through this with the sewer a couple times already. And we weren't eligible. You would have to borrow on the market rate, which uh, uh, getting some indications that interest rates are going to start rising maybe by the end of the, of the year. There's a big story about Janet Yellen and what she was <laughs> pronouncing. So. Again. <laughs> the engineering for the second phase, this is just the ballpark figure that I got a long time ago, probably outdated at least four to six months old was $158,300 just for the design of the second section over there. And that was the base I Was that folded into the cost number? Is that included in the account? Yes. It's included in the account. Oh, yeah. And then the 800 also includes us patching the roadway. Where if we were yes. going along with the Mass Highway project, Correct. we wouldn't patch. We just have to have pipe work, backfill, and they would take care of that. That's why I asked for the waiver. So. Is there an impact fee as to what the cost, what, what the impact would be to the expenses now per gallon cubic foot? Have we done an impact fee? No, we don't. Okay. All right. So actually, do we have an updated schedule on it? If we had, if we told the engineers to start now, how long would it take them to actually do, make the design changes we wanted? That I would have to ask. I couldn't even venture a guess. We don't have the second section, the money for the second section, or actually the first section either. So we did not commit anything to the engineering firms yet for the second section. The first section is already out designed, which is right in that set of plans. But the second section is not. So you can just ask him what he, that. He was pretty specific. Like, it was about four months ago, you said, Mike? Yeah. When we talked to him? Yeah. And uh, he, he, he was pretty solid with that number for the second section. Yeah. Did you get a timing for the design time, though? Didn't, didn't really ask him because I didn't know what the board wanted to do, pursue both or just one. So. Well, we've already got the first part designed. Right. So could you ask them for a, a time yeah. schedule to design the second phase? Yeah, I can do that. And then that actually would help us because they actually plan to start construction on this section and it's supposed to be June 2016. Yeah, so they're going to bid it in October. This year. And then they'll let them start as soon as. Oh man, maybe they can start like on graduation weekend. <laughs> How far out are the SRF loans? Not before. Uh, uh, are they available or are they not available? Yeah, we would have to start it. We would have to start it. Uh, and the process would be. You know, now. That's yeah. what I mean. This summer. Okay. Then you'll find out. But then we don't have the you're ill, you're Ill to, uh, qualify. And qualify for it. Yeah. So we're meeting with our chief financial advisor on Friday about this and other issues. Uh, and we'll also be developing for you the uh, information about the water rates and what kind of uh, time frame you need in order to start thinking about this for the first payment uh, on. Loans. I don't think that you would see a first payment until so you'll have that fall of 2016 after the project was done. Well, if this is in the worst case scenario, it's 93,000. This is starting point, and that's a diminishing schedule, mm -hmm. right? So if it's 93,000, it looks like total water receipts are like 1.1. Yes. About, right? Mm -hmm. So you're looking at Double. just south of 10%, so 8 point something percent. I know it's not. That neat and tidy, but in the ballpark, I think it's it says 7.5%. No, I mean the, the impact of this relative oh. to what people are currently paying for water. Eight percent. You can you maybe think about using water reserves to offset the impact of a, of an increase. Right, right, but they're mix and match. Yeah. yeah. Actually, maybe we should just schedule a little work game meeting outside as a separate time and we can all just sit down and talk about this and only this item. Mm -hmm. That would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. sure. So, 
why don't, why don't we start pulling the information together? You'll have our meetings. You're going to have that meeting next this Friday, so getting some more information for us. Yes. Yeah, after that. Yes, so after, after that. that. Okay. Talk about it July 1st. Um, no, just a separate meeting when we sit down. Right, right but there. I mean, talk about planning. Well, when the plan meet, yes. Yeah. That's fine. All right. So, our police chief is here to talk to us about something he wishes to do. His plan to uh, cut back on overtime, which we keep asking him to take a look at, and he's come up with a proposal, or he's come up with a method plan. he wants to do, that try for two months. Correct. It's a, it's a temporary, temporary plan. Um, it really is the first step in kind of a long process that's going to take uh, cooperation between a lot of different entities in town, to, you know, the police union, finance committee, the board, uh, and myself. This is really the first step. And the thought process is, um, because it's a slight alteration in the way that we do business normally as far as contracts go, uh, it had to be presented to the police union uh, to vote on. Because it does, it does alter. It doesn't necessarily alter the language in that contract, but it alters our, our normal practices. The idea behind it is that we would like to advance the department and cut the overtime at the same time. Uh, it doesn't rationally make sense that those two things go together. Uh, but when you start talking about minimum staffing and the wages that we are paying folks at time and a half, uh, as opposed to straight rate. I think that, like I said, with, uh, with cooperation with the different entities in town, I think we can, we can really do this. So my proposal to the union was that we add additional part-time and special officers throughout the summer months. Initially, I was looking at June, July, and August. That's not really feasible. June was out of the question just because of where the budget is at right now. And July and August to do the full month um, really was just, it was going to be a lot to ask for for a brand new chief to go to the finance committee and ask for that, uh, the additional funding to do that. So what I thought was is that we could try um, to add additional officers very similarly the way that we do now, which is additional officers on the so-called more busy nights of the week, which would be Thursday through, through Saturday, Tuesday through Sunday. So what I did was I put together a plan for them to add these additional officers while our minimum mandatory staffing during the summer months is at its lowest, which is two officers. We would add a part-timer or special only. As many of these shifts throughout Thursday through Sunday, I won't bore you with details as we possibly can. And each time one of those officers is working and a full-time officer takes the day off, they will be granted the day off uh, with with a proper approval. And because of the staffing levels, we would not be required to fill that shift with overtime. We would run at our minimum mandatory staff and utilizing that part-timer or special officer who is on currently on duty. So essentially it is the average overtime rate as of now before uh, contract negotiations come up and salaries change is, is a little over $30 an hour. Part-timers and specials rates vary, but you're looking at anywhere between 17 and a half, and, and a special is $15 an hour. So it's essentially, if a special is working a shift, we don't have to fill an open shift with overtime. It's, you're literally saving half the money. So that was the plan. It was presented to the union a couple of weeks ago. They, they wanted to chew on it a little bit. And to their credit, um, they voted last night to accept the proposal. Uh, because it is a temporary proposal, and um, I feel that uh, the way that they look at it is that is the same way that I do. Uh, that this is the, really the first step in, in moving our department forward. So what I wanted to do was was present the idea to you folks. You have it more defined on paper. Uh, that's really just it in a nutshell. Um, and I just wanted to, to talk to you folks about it and, and see if there's any questions, comments, or condemnations uh, to the idea. So this is a uh, 
proof of concept? Is that really what that you're trying to accomplish? That is exactly what it is. That's the, uh, so you I, see how it goes? Right. I, I presented the, the full concept to the Finance Committee just this past budget cycle. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to really like it. They seem to really feel like the theory uh, in and of itself was, um, was really kind of where they were hoping that this would go. Unfortunately, it's a lot different if I go through our schedule book and say this is what would have happened had we had these extra officers on, whereas I can actually show them real life numbers. And um, you really can expand done. off of this. I mean, if this works, you can start this throughout the year. Uh, well, I mean, and it's it's a good way to get your part timers and your specials in there and training with the full time officers. I mean. Well, you're right. This is really no an open-ended proposal, really. That's really what it is right now. You're right. It would be, it would certainly be uh, um, beneficial. But the hopes is that you know the way we stand right now, number one, it would have to be represented to the union, and it would no longer be a temporary thing. And now, now we're talking big changes here. But the, the really where we stand right now is a part-time police officer makes the same rate as a starting full-time officer here, as we stand right now. So with the amount of hours that we are backfilling with our part-time officers, we're getting into situations where some of these officers are getting benefits. So my thought is, let's look at this from kind of an outside-the-box perspective and look at possibly turning these part-time officers into full-time officers, full-time positions, and eliminate this overtime problem altogether. While at the same time, adding additional staffing to our department and moving us forward into uh, a place where we really need to be. But yeah, that's correct, Molly. This is really a proof of concept to just show real life numbers rather than theories. Yeah. Yeah, you and I were talking about the structure of the, uh, the numbers in order to uh, test this in a number of different ways by showing overall over the two months period what kind of impact it would have upon. But also within each week you could shop from from segment of days to segment of days you can show that that, that impact. Exactly. I, I, you know, like I said, I, the figures that I gave the, the Finance Committee are, are, are literally staggering. Um, and I'm not saying that uh, because I'm in charge of the department and I think this is a good <coughs> idea. If, if this, in my in my thought process, the way that I see this going, if everything falls into place appropriately and contracts, language is altered successfully, we're looking at being able to re reduce overtime, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent um, if we extrapolate this out throughout the year. So that's why I'd like to do this because we really can, we'll get a good idea as to what's really going to happen. And on top of that, the summer months, um, they, they quiet down for us with this, with the students gone, but extra staffing on the road is always what we've been looking for uh, in the summer months. The two officers on duty sometimes really isn't enough. So this will give the officers an opportunity to, to have, when no one takes a day off, to have that extra staffing on the road. And the benefit to the town is on those days when someone does take the day off, we would have normally had to fill it with overtime. We no longer have to do that during these shifts. I, I commend you, Michael, for um, bringing this forward as a strong chief and uh, you know, showing us what you've been working on since your induction into being the chief. You said you would take a stab at reducing this, and you certainly have. So I commend you for bringing it forward and showing us you are a strong chief, and I wholeheartedly uh, um, support you on this. And I also would like to commend the officers for um, taking the initiative before even negotiations started to at least give this a try. So, um, yeah, kudos to all of you. Any comments? It absolutely looks like it's going to work. I just hope we can expand on it. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And I think the officers do as well. I just We just need to find the best possible way to do it. Let's go step by step. Going to have a tough, tough couple of days, aren't you? Two in a row? The next two days are going to be pretty rough for you guys with with the traffic on Route 9, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah. We're uh, Sergeant Cook has actually been working on trying to get together with uh, with a lot of the, the workers out there. We got to try to figure out a, a better plan for how we're going to do this. It's going to be rough, but 
We'll get through it. Start paving Route 9 tomorrow morning, 4 to 5. There you go. 4 to 4. 4 to 4, and I think the other one's going to be an hour. Stay up Route 9. Oh, yeah. we're yeah, go, go <laughs> Good day to bike. Good day for people to just take two days off. Exactly. All right. Thanks, Chief. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Westover, you wish to talk to us. Great. I'll try to keep it short. Thanks. Thanks for going out of work. Um, before I show you the map, let me just give you a little background. So, the, the question. Uh, is whether the town will be willing to accept the gift of a trail and parking easement at Old Mountain Road from uh, Hoyo College. So just by background, my firm, Conservation Works, is under a year and a half long contract with Pine Valley Planning Commission to develop uh, trail connections in five different places in Hadley and South Hadley uh, relating to the Connecticut River and relating to Route 47, which is the scenic highway. And um, this particular project is basically to improve the last 100 yards of what used to be the m, &M Trail and is now the New England National Scenic Trail, thanks to John, John Over. <laughs> um, you, if you know the location, you, you've come by the Mount Holyoke College Outing Club cabin on the way down to Old Mountain Road. And the last 100 yards is pretty steep, and the, the last few yards is almost vertical. So if you have kids or dogs or something, you end up in the middle of the road before you can slow down. Um, you know, I, I run the Seven Sisters race every year, and, and I don't mind running on rocks, but a lot of people don't. Um, so the, the idea is to close the last uh, short section of the trail and move it over off of land of that belongs to the Buckhouse onto land of Mount Hoyo College and end up in a very small parking area that we would like to put in just to create kind of a, a better trailhead. Something rather than you know ending with a bang at the at the edge of the road. And uh, we've met with uh, just about all the neighbors several times, met with the Holyoke Range Advisory Committee, uh, and, and worked closely with Mount Holyoke College in, in coming up with a design. I've, I've talked to Dave Nixon several times about this. And uh, I was out with Ed from Hadley Public Works the other day. We walked the site, and then he talked about it with Mike Mosky later. And, we're going to follow whatever suggestions they have because drainage is a concern along the road there, and we want to make sure that's done correctly. The funding uh, is in process. We, we have applied for a federal uh, land access program grant called FLAT. We don't know if we'll get it yet. Uh, there is a possibility of a recre state recreational trails grant. We've applied for that too. So. Uh, it's you know it's work in progress. It, does everybody have the the map? So I don't know where I need to hold this up, but where's Mr. Buckle's property now that it comes out on? Right, right down here. Okay. Yeah. And you know the Seven Sisters race turns around right there. They're good enough to make their land available for that. And then here's the real steep part that'll be closed. Yeah. So this will be kind of diagonally running across the slope uh, with a you know, very, very gradual uh, angle. And then the little parking spot is here. This is not on land of DCR, which was recently purchased from the Barstows. It's, it's on uh, the corner of the Mount Hoyo College land. And there's some, there's some extra details if anybody wants to look. The, uh, the parking detail and then the draft easement and another color map. So. so right now, do snowmobilers or anybody else use this trail? Not really. I don't know know that it's that they're prohibited, but it's a it's a hiking trail. And this part is definitely too steep for snowmobiles anyway. You know, so we're not expecting that kind of use. But it will be prohibited anyway. Right? Yeah. All terrain it, vehicles. Yeah, especially on this part. Uh, one question is the ongoing maintenance of the parking spot and the uh, in the new section of trail. And I, I talked again to Dom Sacco uh, with DCR today, and he said, "Yes, DCR will be able to 
monitor the, the site um, at a low level because, you know, they're under a lot of stress. They've lost people and uh, we may have to call on some of the partner organizations that have worked on this whole project. They have, in talking with somebody up in Salisbury, um, they're doing a waterway up there and he had said that there were a lot of that had taken the early retirement, which yeah. really yeah. cut their... Yeah. But DCR has also uh, posted where they shouldn't have posted on our property um, in not wanting people to pass um, certain areas um, going toward the reservation. Is that correct? Out in that area. And, you know, really didn't have any business doing that. But yeah. um, this here section, do we have to, have you met, seen this, Michael? Yes, I have. I went out there with Ed, looked at it. Pete on Mike Lamosky, if you don't know. Yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> I looked at that, and your proposal for a culvert pipe, I believe, was mentioned for the access for the roadway to get up to this. Yeah. <clears throat> Experience tells me that there is a tremendous amount of water that can come down that road in a heck of a hurry. And I am hesitant to say, yes, I agree with a culvert pipe. I was looking at the layout of the land. Is there any way that you could just put some rock in there to take away such the steep incline that you have and use the rock as your driveway instead of a culvert pipe? Because as we all know, that road is gravel. <clears throat> and in the wintertime, we have to plow it. In the summertime, we have to grade it. And it's been prone to washouts. We had one there probably 15 years ago that cost the town over 25 grand to fix because it was just a, too much water too fast off the mountain and off the road. And any obstruction, a culvert pipe, you're not going to have much culvert to cover over this culvert pipe because of what you have to work with there. You're probably going to have a foot of cover or two. So that's not really adequate in the size of the pipe would have to be at least as big as the one that is there that crosses the road just towards South Hadley side a little bit farther, let's say not much, probably 50 feet from north. So I was going yeah, to... Yeah, I think you may very well be right. Uh, well, I'd like to work with you on that just to, mm -hmm. just to make sure it comes out right. And the neighbors are really concerned about the drainage, and, right. and I know it's a concern of yours, so right. and we'll then, make sure that's done right. Right. And How big then, is the park? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Then there was the uh, situation of the trees. I guess you have some there marked to be cut. Just a few. You you got to get in, and there's right. one dead tree that'll come right. out where right. it'll go in. But right. otherwise, not much. Not much. I saw you had some ribbons, and I saw where the ribbons were for your access. Yeah, the ribbons are just to mark the perimeter, right. not to mark trees to be right. cut. Right. Exactly. So. How many cars are you figure in parking there? Six. Roughly. It'll be 40 by 60, so you go in and you park three on the left or three on the right. Okay. So it's not very big, but it'll get some of the, you know, some of the cars that are often parked along the road uh, into a safer spot. And the reason you want us to hold the easement? Uh, <laughs> I think it's appropriate because, for one thing, Castro Land Trust, uh, uh, is not really interested in doing that. And somebody's got to hold the easement. And uh, I, I think in this case, um, we'll, we'll make sure that the, the maintenance is covered by, for one thing, there's a partnership of Appalachian Mountain Club and DCR and, and a few others that are working on this. But just to hold the easement. Uh, so we'll hold like the easement. Possible and have no responsibility for maintenance, and the maintenance will come from the, the trail organizations, and there'll be a sec side agreement with them that they're, what they're gonna maintain exactly. to make sure that yeah, Mount Holyoke yeah. College is happy and we're happy. Yeah. yeah. Is that how, I mean, that's kind of yeah. how I've seen it done in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So to accept an easement, do we have to have permission from town meeting to yeah, I'm not entirely sure of the legal ways that we do this, and I'm thinking a town meeting vote is, is ultimately going to be necessary. But I, don't I, don't, know. I don't think so. I know from my experience that a gift of either land or an easement will, will need the, the uh, signatures of the select board, but not a vote of town meeting. 
So for tonight, I'm willing to say we're in conceptual support of this. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we'll research legality, legality how, how we do this, whether we got to go to me or not. And then if we can get an agreement with the, the trail groups yeah, about great. maintenance, yeah. and then we can look at that as well. Because we, I don't think we want to. How big an area is that easement? Do you have a copy down over there? Oh. Well, the easement is, the parking lot is this size. And then the easement is on the trail. The trail easement's about 500 feet worth. The linear, linear distance. And the so you're talking parking. trail and the parking lot. Trail and parking. They're both uh, defined in the um, in the easement document. Yeah. And Mount Holyoke College still owns that property. They didn't get yeah. the DCR or cash flow. Right. So, are we in conceptual agreement yep. pending we research the. Uh, I'll bring more details. And we get the end. So, all right. Yeah. Do we need to vote on that? I think, I think if you want to take a conceptual uh, agreement vote uh, tonight, then we can work out the details with council. That would be helpful. All right. I would actually rather that we somehow posted this and got some impact from the neighbors so that we, exactly. before we before we acted on that, I, I, I think we need to notify the neighbors and have them in here and find out what their feelings are regarding this. If they want to come in. If they want to come in. If they don't want to come in, I understand that too. So Can we do a conceptual agreement with? Subject to. Subject to. I'll make a motion. We do a conceptual agreement subject to notification of the abutters. Um, for our next meeting. Well, and for, 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 for a scheduled meeting. For a scheduled meeting. Are you, are you talking about butters or the general neighborhood? Because I know there are quite a few people who are interested and might want to come in, even if they don't directly apply. The general neighborhood, I think. Because yeah. I think we've had we've already had some other neighbors come in. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the approval from town council. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I will second that. Right, so we're willing to continue looking at this, schedule a public hearing, do some research on how we have to do the takings and mm -hmm. look at the maintenance agreement between us and and the trail groups. Mm -hmm. All right, well, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. We're off and running. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because I had it fixed, 
however, is still extreme, uh, to say the least. And if I were to receive a sewer abatement, and I, I remember um, Mr. Mooring, you actually said last time, you know, I got 100% sewer abatement, you were like, well, theoretically, some water went through the sewer. So I copied a typical water bill, which would put sewer at about 142 bucks. So I'm just requesting that I, you consider a sewer abatement minus typical sewer, and that you consider a water abatement equal to what you did on the previous bill, which would result in a total cost to me for the week at over 5,600 bucks. Mr. Kamaski? As you know, we have a letter from the uh, collector's office pertaining to both of these locations for 5 West Street and the 6 Spring Street, and she has recommendations on the amounts to bake for the water and the sewer. And the amount to <coughs> bake the water for number 5 West Street would be $1,767.57, and to bake the sewer, $3,704.80. That is from the five question. That is from the collector's office. I believe the board has that. And you agree? Yes. And at the time that Mr. Brennan came to us in the first place, we had detected the, uh, well, he had detected the leak at his uh, property um, after the change of the billing cycle, so mm -hmm. that we at that time we acknowledged that that there would be a spillover into the second billing cycle, which is what we see here today. All right. So and I would just like to add, I also sat through an audit review as part of punishment for, <laughs> for the water leak. I guess you're some sort of chip here. <laughs> uh, yeah. I would like to take a recommendation. My cousin. Uh, what? Just a quick comment on the sewer. I guess he wasn't, I wasn't here for this first round of abatements. I guess he wasn't billed that out for the sewer. Why well, was that completely abated? Right. It should have been $142, right? Right. Uh, Guilford, I guess you mentioned that it was completely abated and some of it had to go through the sewer, correct? So we looked into that and the usage for the last cycle, full six months of reading was 10,300 cubic feet, last abatement granted was incorrect, there was no sewer charges that were billed at all. The usage for the six months, 10,300 times two cycles equals 20,600. So we divided that 20,600 by 100 cubic feet, multiplied that by the rate, and what he should have been charged for the sewer, according to what we calculated out, was $947. So are you saying these numbers should be adjusted? Well, I'm just bringing this to light because you mentioned that you know there was some of that had to go through the sewer. Some of that water was actually used, even though it was all reported at the leak. I had a discussion with the water commissioner concerning typical water bills for Five West Street, and was told they were in a $250 range for sewer right. and water supply and a typical, of course I've never got a water bill before, but I was told that that was typical. Right. That's why, where, and I included a copy of a previous bill to show $142 is roughly. Did you have a choice? Did you have a motion? I was just going to accept uh, the collector's suggestion. Is there a second? That's seconded. Okay, so we're willing to abate. The motion is to abate you $1,796.57 on water, $3,704.80 on your sewer bill. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All who oppose? Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Don't you love then you love the audit? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> all right, so how are these numbers gonna get <laughs> how's this gonna get converted so he understands it? Is she gonna resend a bill with these numbers now? So what we do is we fill out abatement forms which then uh, are processed by water and sewer and the collectors and uh, and you'll be paying the, the bill that you will bill my
minus the uh, calculations. Yeah, um, so I, the, I, I requested an official bill, but I was told I couldn't have that last time. Uh, is that the case? I don't get a new bill. What did you say last time? Uh, yeah. the, for my first bill, they didn't send me a new bill. Uh, they just gave me the abatement, I think. Are you saying the same thing? I'm not going to get a no, new bill. No, no, because I think the first bill you hadn't paid, and you've, you've since paid, uh, right. and you've paid the abated amount. So now I think you have not paid for this second bill. Right. All right, so well, I know, you'll I know pay the abated amount for it. Well, you know how much? I guess my question is, will I get an actual piece of paper with the new, with the new yeah. number on it? Yeah. Great. We'll that would be great. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. You're actually going to appreciate it. I'm the less All right, since we're doing abatements, we have one for French Street. Well, yeah, same, that's right. same thing we have on the uh, from the collector's office for number six French Street to Bay Water in the amount of three thousand two hundred fifty one dollars and ninety six cents, and to abate the sewer in the amount of seven thousand seven hundred seventy five dollars and fifteen cents. So, what caused this one? This one was a pipe that was frozen, split, leaking, and was actually coming out of the. Uh, Cellar. Cellar window going into North Hadley Pond for a period of time. So <clears throat> I guess the heat was shut off there. This house, there was someone living in there, but I guess you didn't realize it. But that's where the balls lie now on, on this one. The average usage on this one, total usage was 215,600 cubic feet. And she calculated it out, what it would come out to be, and the total amount of the abatement should be $3,251, which I mentioned earlier, for the water. And the sewer is the larger abatement because I believe she felt that since it was running out the window, it did not actually be used to go through the sewer system. That was actually just a tremendous major leak. So should we charge our stormwater fee instead? <laughs> we have to come up with a fee schedule first. I think this is an extreme hardship case. Yeah. yeah. She didn't know she was doing this. Yeah. This is another one where never bubbled up because it went right in the pond. Went right in the pond. From her cellar. Blowing right out the back like a stream. Mm -hmm. oh 216,000 cubic feet. Correct. But it was blown out the back. How did you guys ever come up with the 225 per cubic feet for the abatement? She is that is that a base cost yeah, for? Yeah, wanted to use the lowest rate, I believe, on that. Okay. That's uh, in line with how we uh, addressed Mr. Brennan the first right. time he came to us. Mm -hmm. We didn't actually abate anything. We just charged the entire amount at the lowest uh, rate that you can. I make a motion. We accept the collector's uh, recommendations for number six French Street. Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So let's work on getting Mike out of here. Mike, you have a pay request? Yep. For Schultz Construction, payment request number 11. And so I'll just briefly read what it was for. Installation of HVAC components with the controls in the buildings, site grading, loam seating placement, completion of pump skid assembly at pump station number one prior to start up, and then there's some for number four, installation of the low grade pumping station, connection of mechanical piping, the low grade station, and the wet well with fifty connection to the force main. So and the amount of the payment, I believe, on the second page is Sixty-one thousand three hundred two point nine nine. You're comfortable with the work? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Any other questions, comments? I would just like to give the board just a little brief of what's happening, what's going on there at pump station number one. We haven't had a construction progress meeting, so I asked the engineer to just give us some bullet points of what's left to do there. 
Schultz is currently working to de demolish existing pumps, electrical equipment, existing station, facilitate new, gener new generator, work remaining, generator installation, load bank testing, site grading, restoration, lining of existing wet well access, that's at pump station one. Pump station number four, they have to do, is currently working on a cleanup of the site from the previous excavations. As we know, the tie-in was just uh, occurred last week. Dig and lay electrical conduit to the new station, install electrical panels, connect discharge piping to the new station, construct access platform to the new station, construct bypass connection to the precast manhole, start up the new pump station, demolish existing pump station, and then the actual site grading and finished work to be done on that one. So that's what they have left to do for work. Okay. Estimated completion date? I believe it's the end of July. They asked for an extension on that, David, did they not? That's right. So substantial completion by end of July, final payment by end of August. Okay. This completes how much of our payment schedule? We have 5% retainage, uh, which we haven't started paying out on, uh, I believe. <coughs> uh, so another $60,000 left. Uh, should be on there. That's right, right there, the first page. That's way off the two hundred ninety-five thousand dollars. Oh yeah, yeah. That includes the retainage. Yeah. Oh, no, plus retainage. No. Plus retainage associated. Yeah, that's plus retainage. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Helps pay. All right. Do you wish to talk to us about sludge? Yes. I'm waiting for this. <coughs> Franklin County uh, enclosed the sludge hauling and disposal pricing for FY16. <clears throat> the district has decided to maintain the current administrative fee charge for FY16. And on the second page, uh, the third page, second page of the uh, memorandum of understanding that the board has to sign. On the third page is the sludge hauling cost for July 1, 2015 through June 30th, 2016, actually for Hadley and Hatfield. So we looked at these prices and what we've been using is the one on the very bottom, which is the Montague <coughs> in disposal facility at Montague and the transportation cost per 9,000 gallons is $285. We broke that down to match per gallon what the other people have proposed for prices and it comes out to 0 .0, 0 0.3088 which is the lowest of all the people that put in their prices for it. So I believe the board has to sign this to get this one removed and take it to market. How does that compare to last year's numbers? Uh, last year's was 278 and the dry disposal cost for last year was 304. Make a motion to approve. Second. Any more? Any other discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Mike, do you have anything else? Just the roof, but David uh, actually is for Gary Berg for the senior center. Go ahead. Talk to Gary Berg about it. He says everything is up to. Uh, code on it, and I believe the uh, building inspector, as you said, signed off on it for payment. Number five, the buildings. I believe that's what David mentioned something about it. I'm sorry, what was your payment? For the rivet. For the, for the rivet. So right. Thank you. Yeah. The building inspector's okay with it. Yes, so yes, we've received the uh, inspection. On the, uh, on the project, so that that project is now complete. Right, and I spoke okay. with Gary Berg, and he's pleased with the work. Yeah. Make a motion to approve. Second. Good discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Okay. Maybe we'll start at the bottom and work our way back up. So we have our annual appointments. We need to make some appointments tonight. And I misplaced my list. They're in the box, so they should be a newspaper. Yeah. Yeah, it's right here, I misplaced it. 
I'm sorry, I probably grabbed it on you. Oh, you have two? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Trying to help the chair out. Right? Thank you. Okay, so we need to do all these appointments tonight, or are we going to do some of these tonight? Well, you, you, have, you have one more bite at the apple on July 1st. You're meeting again. Uh, you can reappoint everybody on July 1st. So, um, can we make that part of the consent agenda? We could if we want to. Yeah. Yeah. So we yeah, we presented you with this information at the last meeting. Yeah. Um, we can take a little bit more time if you need it. So is there any concerns we have about any of the appointments or lack of appointments? Like them posted, what's not filled? Yeah, we have a cemetery committee for Old Hadley and Plainville. There's a vacancy there. But there are people maintaining them now. There are. Any, any, any. No, I didn't. I didn't have an issue, so. You have a vacancy in the agricultural uh, area incentive committee. Yeah, they're not on there anymore, are they? They're on there. They're not active. What about David Moskin? Is he still on the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission? So, capital planning, um, who did anybody replace Mr. Aquadro in the plan capital planning from finance? That would be um, Lynn McKenna. So, we need to make Upgrade that change. Is that? CPA has new positions. So there's uh, three vacancies in the long range planning implementation committee. That's been defunct last meeting. So we don't want to reappoint them? I think they asked to be go stagnant. Dormant? I don't know the right word. Laid down. Laid down. It just has cool connotations to it. Laying down a committee. So we're going to take that one off the list. To At their request. Okay. Treasure. The, uh, on the Agricultural Commission, isn't there a um, Historical Agricultural The Agricultural Council. Commission, didn't we appoint the um, Hushai boy? Wasn't he on the Agricultural Commission? Did we appoint him this year? I don't see his name um, on there. I'm trying to dredge up his name. I'm trying to. Um, I know we appointed him to the Agricultural Commission. Yeah, and he's been active on it. Is it name out there? His name is not here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Matt, is it? Yeah. That's it. That's yeah, the Matt name. Matt mm -hmm. So then if we do this as an agenda calendar item, I would just ask that we actually put the date on here. We have June 2014 on it, the one we have on our hands. Okay. So just appointments. All right. So we're going to do this as a consent agenda for uh, July 1st. Yeah. Okay. With the right names on With those changes and dating it. Right. Okay. So, new item number four, we need to accept Mr. Serio's resignation from HPAT Advisory Committee. I'd like to have uh, the board send a letter of thanks to Pat for his uh, participation on the HPAT Advisory Committee and um, wish him a healthy life and thank him for volunteering. Okay. I'll second that. So, any other discussion? All those in favor of accepting the resignation? Aye. 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 All right. Town Administrator Annual Review. Discussion of the evaluation format and presentation information. So we have an update from the Town Administrator on his goals and objectives. And that's for us to have for our discussion on July 1. Mm -hmm. So 
you have any questions about what was given to you, please email it into them into the time measure between now and July 1. I believe there's also a form that uh, you would circulate it and I've uh, just produced it here in the book. Uh, it didn't go to the full, it only went to you and Guilford for comments, so this is the first time the I first, have one. The, yeah, this is for us to talk over and decide. Okay. Right, but right. this is the, their first scene right, of right, this. Right. Yeah. So the, the, the form is also up for discussion as to whether it's appropriate or complete uh, for this purpose. Okay. So um, and just quick background. Um, this was a form that uh, David had sent uh, a couple of form, two different formats. They were similar but yet different. Um, so the only thing that I did was try to backfill in these um, key objectives, key responsibilities, took the goals that we had agreed on at the beginning of the year and tried to kind of condense them and fit them into these expectations, mm -hmm. right? So, and then you had a chance to look at it and you said that you were okay with it. Mm -hmm. so. so then do we want to go ahead and have them to make our rough comments for the July 1st meeting as well? That's rough comments for? On the evaluation, on his uh, form, or his goals. Well, actually on the form, because we were going to have him present his we have his uh, goals and objectives as he is now, and right. he's going to talk more about those on the, on the July 1st meeting. Yep. And then if we have any comments on the form, we should have those for the next meeting. Yeah, too. on the form, but we wouldn't be doing our actual... No, we're not doing our yeah. <laughs> Okay. Right. It's getting late. Yeah. So we're, so we're doing edits to the form. Yes. If any more. It's on the evaluation itself. Yeah. Okay. The percentage here that it, of the weight, I mean, is that apropos? It's, it's my first look at it, too. I mean, is that? Yeah, and Jerry, I will tell you, the only thing I did with the weighting was I literally just, um, well, that second group are the, our organizational standards. Yes. And so I just simply divided. They had a like a 50%, 50% as a starting point. Okay. So I just took 50 divided by the five objectives. And then um, on the first part of it, you can see it wound up being 12.5% uh, because there were only four. So I didn't, I'm not suggesting applying any particular heavier weighting to one over the other, but okay. that's certainly part okay. of this. Okay, so um, I've also, last week, uh, the select board asked me to do a weekly summary of uh, where we are with our major projects, so I took a stab at that. You asked me to keep this to one page and I managed to keep it to three. Okay. Uh, so the, provide some additional information. Um, the chair had asked me to also set up a, a, a calendar for the fire chiefs uh, the goals and objectives. And I believe we have that set up for July 15th for his presentation. And then finally, during the contract uh, negotiations with the chief of police, uh, you had identified the town administrator as the person who would work with the chief of police on goals and objectives. So I had a conversation with Chief Mason about that and asked him to start preparing his goals and objectives for the coming years. All right, excellent. Any comments about the weekly project updates? Um, I just saw it tonight, but that I found it immediately helpful. <laughs> so, so my only comment right now. Yeah, happy to do it. So then my, my comment, if we are okay with this format, mm -hmm. is that this is probably something we should go ahead and put on the, on the town webpage. So this is, the, this is the report from the town administrator to the select board. We can put it on the, on the webpage as a, you know, dated, this is the update as of this time period. And that way other people can look at it as well, see how things are going. Because it would take quite a while to read all this, out loud. Yeah, but is there anything on here um, that lends itself to, there's, there wouldn't be anything on here that would be. This uh, is a public document, so yeah. there's no reason why it couldn't go on the, the website. The only sensitive issues are um, uh, with the collective bargaining agreements and the, uh, the, the two personnel issues, so listed under uh, legal. And the, right. I think I've, just, I've been in general, general in my enough. language. Yeah, okay. okay. Are we meeting next Tuesday? 
Uh, I believe we are. I believe we are. Okay. We did speak with John. I'll confirm that. Okay. I'll check in with you tomorrow. Yep. I'm actually out Thursday and Friday, so. You're not going north? Well, no, I'm not going north this week. No. I have until 3 on Friday, so. Um, if you wanted to meet on Friday, I'm not sure what John's. I'll have to check in with John. I know that she's taking time right now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Still plan it for Tuesday then. Oops. Okay, so for when you talk about our next meetings, so we've already scheduled a July 1st meeting, mm -hmm. which is also the tri board meeting. Tri board, that's correct. So we have scheduled a July 15th meeting. We've only done two for July. Oh, I thought we had the 8th too. No. And do we put the 8th? The 8th is also the night of the. Uh, Town and gown, uh, reception town. with the with right. the chancellor. So right. you can meet on the eighth, but uh, just be aware of that. Last year, I think we weren't able to go because we received the invitation somewhat late, and we had a scheduled meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So it would be nice to be able to go. The uh, the RFIs are coming in already. So the RFI is due on August 3rd. Uh, I have received an inquiry or two. Uh, we did talk about that during the pre bid conference this morning with members of the Municipal Building Committee. I mean, they're, they're just public inquiries, so they, they should be available to the Building Committee and to us, I suppose. Sure. The building committee asks that if we received any written responses on the RFI for property, that they see them as they come in, uh, given that this is not a uh, uh, procurement process. Uh, there's no reason why we couldn't do that. Okay, so the meetings. So right now we just have two, two meetings in July. The first, and there's a subcommittee meeting in the morning, right, with the Town. With Molly, you meet with the town? Yeah, on the first. Okay. Yep. And you're going to come keep me company? I am. Okay. All right. I've prepared the agenda for that. So if I could get a copy, please, yep. at your convenience. We'll be doing the asbestos discussion and then we'll do the uh, calendar discussion. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. First and then what? 15th. 15th. And if we decide on the first or 15th, we want to try another one, we can try to, we, we can do that or we can not. So then August, the first meeting would be the 5th. Yeah. And the 12th and 19th. Uh, we'll can we try to get the back on the 12th as being our working summer time? Do you want to just do two? Yeah. You're, you're well, welcome. it says the 5th and the 12th in here. You're welcome to meet on the 19th, but I will not be here. Oh, that's why we did the 5th and the 12th. We right. skipped the 19th and right. 26th. Right. Okay. And then September 2nd and 9th and the 6th of so September, we crank back up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First day of school is going to be September 2nd. <coughs> Labor Day is September so that, 7th. Is that what we're doing? So the 2nd? 2nd, 9th, and 16th. Yep. So the 9th is going to be. We were choosing, using the first meeting as select as a uh, tri-board. Usually it is. Mm -hmm. So that'll be the six o'clock on the second. Tri-board on the second, you said? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, so on the eighth then, if we choose to, we can go to Hillside. Yes. Yes. The first the July first will be in here. The fifteenth will be at a place to be determined. That's right. Yes. Okay. Okay. We could do that. What's this about? That's so we're going. Okay. So we have one item left. Yes. Net metering credits. So uh, we have a second opportunity to sign up for net metering credits. Just a little bit of history about two years ago. We had an opportunity through the SREC 1 program, a solar renewable energy certificate 1 program, to uh, uh, sign up 70% of the town load for electrical consumption 
under a solar agreement, which would give a 21% discount on that uh, 70%. Uh, that 70% is represented by five buildings, the two schools, the two treatment plants, and the public safety complex. And this uh, is ex expected to provide savings in electrical energy costs over a 20-year period between $300,000 and $600,000. Uh, we're well on our way to meeting uh, a number well within that range. You know, it's not as not as low as 300. I won't say it's quite as high as 600, but it's a very good program for us. And uh, so now we have a partner with Nexamp that we have some history with. That's with uh, the SREC one program was through the uh, three megawatt facility that is on Millville and Road. Uh, that is uh, uh, operated by, developed and operated by Nexamp. So they're building a second facility of comparable size, and we're looking at the, the remaining 30% of our electrical load, which consists of the nine uh, sewer pump stations, the, most of the rest of the municipal buildings, such as Town Hall, the library, the senior center, Russell School, not North Hadley Village Hall, recognizing that we're going to be selling at the, the highway garage, uh, as well as the street lights, uh, which would represent about 30% of our remaining electrical load. Uh, we have an opportunity through an SREC 2 program, which provides a lower discount, 16% rather than 21%. And these, these percentages are capped by state law. Uh, so we, uh, we don't have any real control over that. Um, but we've been working with Nexamp and our attorney in order to develop the net metering credit program, which would cover that remaining 30% of our electrical load uh, and result in a 20-year savings for minimum $93,000. So I make a recommendation that we uh, sign up. Any other any questions? Concerns, comments? You said this already went through legal review. And yeah, yeah. We did it before, too. I'll make a motion to uh, accept the uh, net metering credits. I'll second it for discussion. For discussion, Mr. Nevada. If, if something else comes down the road three years from now and it's a much better opportunity for us, did we just slit our throat? Um. Are there any availabilities for us to get out of these if opportunities arise? Yeah, so the, the, there is a bailout provision, but it's not an easy one to, uh, to, to utilize if we have just a better offer down the road. I don't see better offers coming down the road under SREC. Um, you know, we were lucky to get 21% of the first program. 16% is right in the market for the second program. In future years, people are going to be fighting over 10 and 5%. Um, so, so there is a clause to get out if it did occur? Yes. Okay. And what does that entail? We would, uh, we would in effect, be uh, partnering with another municipality to sell the, our portion of the electricity credits to them with the help of Nexamp in order to carry out that deal. So, in effect, we would be transferring this agreement over to some other town and and, being, uh, and then we'd be able to enter into some other agreement. Do we need that town to, obviously we need that town to buy into it. Yes, And absolutely. if they have better options available, why would they do that? Right. Mm -hmm. So in effect, there is no option. Okay. Well, you just well, decided. breach of contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we don't want to do that. No, we don't. That bring, breach of contract brings up another issue. So our original, we sold our original percentage of electricity to the next dam project that's also partnered with the COG. Mm -hmm. So if the COG goes under, does that program and those credits still come to us? Yes, they do. The only thing that the, the COG receives under our first net metering credit uh, program is a, uh, uh, a small uh, payment, a subsidized payment to them for their services in negotiating the the first agreement. So that would be the only change is that we wouldn't be paying the call. We would not nullify the agreement. Okay. So if we actually, so what we're saying now is if we do this, we've allocated almost all of our Yeah, I mean, I, it gives you, 
it doesn't give you much room to uh, um, go out on the market again for anything else. Uh, and, but it does give you enough room so that if you wanted to do energy conservation, there's some room for you to do that. When do you yeah. need this answer by? Uh, it would be nice if I had it uh, no later than July 1st. It was open ended the last time because I, I remember I had brought up a couple of uh, scenarios where if they were to uh, solar panel Hopkins and it became self sufficient, or uh, there was enough room over at the elementary school, so something big enough where, where it would sustain itself, that that option was always open to us. Yeah, but you weren't going to solar panel Hopkins or an elementary How do you know? Because the roofs are too old. Mm -hmm. Unless we do new roofs in those, then we would solar panel them. Hopkins does have no roof. Well, it's, it's still, but we didn't do it then. Oh. Um, it's flat. Landfill? Yeah. Yeah. And it's flat. Yeah, you got a landfill. And you got, oh, you got metal roofs. Well, yeah. yeah. so the issue yeah. with the landfill is, is that it's too far from any power lines that can handle a load like that. Or you're, you'd have to string a mile and a half of line to, to access the landfill. Other than that, I would do it in a heartbeat. So think about it. No, do I do want. I'd, I'd like. I know there's a motion to second on the floor, but I would actually like this brought back uh, to us uh, on the first of July, so that we can ask a few questions. Do you want to draw your motion? I don't know. I don't see what for, but I don't care. We can either vote it up or down, or we can draw. Do what you want. I don't care. You can I'd, draw your second. Out of respect for our esteemed colleague, I would draw my second. <laughs> okay. So we'll talk about we'll talk about it again on the on the first. Yeah, we got so. Okay. So announcements. Get all the questions though. Oh, I, what did you say? Announcements. announcements. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd like to um to to the family of Freddie Bender. Kaharski. Kaharski. I know the last name. I was taking my time. Uh, he um, was a fireman. Um, for many years in North Hadley and uh, served in the service and uh, loved to polka dance. Uh, had two hip replacements so he could keep polka dancing and uh, <laughs> he certainly lived life to the fullest. So um, condolences to his family. Anything else? To election? Oh yes, the election is coming up on Tuesday. Thank you. All right. It's oh, a special break. Yeah. So the election for the school bus and the police cruiser. Uh, so, polls are open from noon until 8 on June 23rd, Tuesday, over Hopkins Academy. People are encouraged to come out and vote. There are two items on the uh, ballot. One is for the school bus for $65,000, and the other is for a police cruiser for $42,000. All right. Stay as far off Route 9 as you can for the next two days. Oh, I could, I could say about uh, Cooley Dickinson is that we're next Tuesday the employees get to do a walkthrough, uh, hard hat walkthrough for the new um, cancer care center that's uh, uh, being completed right now and uh, soon to be opening that pretty soon also, which is a, a great thing for this uh, area. There it is. John? Oh, uh, nothing. I was just. The paving is going to be done between East Street and Spruce Hill Road, I believe. That portion of Route 9 that they had ground up. So. And Hampshire County Relay to Life is on um, uh, Saturday, Friday to Saturday. At Wood Park? At Wood Park. Park. So please join them if you can. All right. So is there another motion we wish to make? Adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, everybody. We'll see you on July 1st.